Hello, lovely internet strangers. In today's video, I will be discussing a comic called Mom, which stands for Mother of Madness, and also the main character is a mom. Get it? Some of you may have heard of this comic already. I heard about it when it was first announced and rolled my eyes so hard they disappeared for a second and I had to go digging around to find them. In case you have no idea what this is about, I'm going to read to you the description from Image Comics. Game of Thrones superstar Amelia Clark, she's the one that plays Daenerys, in case you didn't know, debuts an extra-length three-issue miniseries. The mayhem begins with Maya, under-the-weather scientist by day, over-the-top superhero by night, and back badass single mom 24-7. Deadpool action and fleabag comedy collide when Maya activates her freakish superpowers to take on a secret sect of human traffickers. Mature readers only, comedy and chaos await in the first of three 40-page issues by the glamorous artist of horror, Layla Lies. Sorry if I mispronounced her name. So that description doesn't really convey to you what you're gonna see in this comic. It really is a feminist comic. The main character has powers that are related to her menstrual cycle. Mmm, yes. So I wanted to just rip on this comic, but also talk about feminist satire, which became a thing around, I guess, when online feminism was having its heyday back in 2013, 2014. And the formula for feminist satire, from what I can tell, is looking at the world through your distorted feminist lens, seeing all the things that you think are wrong, jumping a bit into the future, and making society basically exactly the same, but like an exaggerated version of it, where all the problems that you see are even worse and all of the humor comes from jab, jab, am I right, ladies? Like, the only kind of person who would be into this comic, as far as I can tell, is someone who already thinks this way. Somebody who already is a feminist. Someone who's gonna read the stuff in here and be like, yeah, totally. Like, you are not convincing anyone with any of this. And not that Merriam-Webster is all that reliable these days, given that they'll change the definition of a word at the drop of a hat to suit the vocal minorities of the day. But their definition of sex Satire is a way of using humor to show that someone or something is foolish, weak, bad, etc. Humor that shows the weaknesses or bad qualities of a person, government, society, etc. So feminist satire, I guess, meets the criteria of they're at least trying to show the problems that they see, but it's that whole humor part that they just don't quite get. I definitely like was going to laugh, but I just like kept waiting for the things that were funny and I just didn't see them, so maybe like the humor part doesn't start until issue two or three. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am just totally clueless, super judgmental, so I'm gonna let you judge for yourself. Without further ado, Mother of Madness, Mom. This is the cover. Looks pretty interesting, I guess. Here's the credits page. Some more interesting art which after having read the first issue, I'm not really sure what this outfit is about, but there you go. So this is the zoom that I have it set on because there's some full page spreads and I don't wanna have to keep playing around with the zoom as I go along, but Hopefully it's big enough to look at and I will read out all the interesting parts. Just in case anyone needs this disclaimer, this is going to be an NSFW video because there's a lot of swearing in this comic, so you have been warned. Let's proceed. So our protagonist looks down at us over her sunglasses and says, Hello there. My name is Maya Kuiper. I am 29 years old, a single mom, a high school dropout, chemical engineer, part-time sex worker, Thai food junkie, and biological freak of nature. As an aside, she says, Scorpio and Blood Moon Rising, no drama, no water signs. I mean, I think we can all relate to that, right? I enjoy more children's television shows than is probably healthy. I lie to myself every January about using the elliptical I bought four years ago for anything more than an expensive clothes hanger. I get anxiety from feeling like I don't listen to enough podcasts about controlling anxiety, and I made a pacifist run on Undertale my first time through, including escaping the bullet hell. Thank you very much. I am currently trapped 
schmoozing at an Upper West Side corporate after party as part of my boss's entourage for a female empowerment in the workplace initiative. The last CFO had to step down after getting caught soliciting what turned out to be several thousand Mexican scorpions in a trench coat as part of a viral prank sensation. So here we are. Okay, let's pause for a second and just talk about what was on this page. Going back up here. So she's a part-time sex worker because, you know, it's empowering to be a sex worker and just like, you know, part-time, why not? I mean, I don't know if she's like doing OnlyFans. Like is OnlyFans still around in 2049 or has OnlyFans been replaced by something similar? I mean, I thought we were going to have like sex robots by then. We won't even need real human ladies to do sex work. Think about the fact that 2049, oh, it's not that far away, but it's 28 years from now. I'll be almost 60 by then. And the rate of change as far as technology just in my lifetime and the way that things are accelerating makes me think that like the world's going to be a little bit different from the way that, you know, she's described it in this comic, but what the hell do I know? And of course she has to be a single mom because we have to just keep pushing the narrative that like it's okay to be a single mom. And like, look, I'm not trying to like rag on single moms or say if you're a single mom, you're like an evil person, but like, let's not act like being a single mom is like the desirable outcome in life, right? But she's like, look at me. I'm still a badass. I'm at this corporate after party. And even though I'm a high school dropout and a single mom, I'm a chemical engineer and I still have time to be a sex worker part-time. I don't really know how, like how part-time are we talking? In 28 years, are like feminists still going to be obsessed with Ruth Bader Ginsburg? I think they're trying to be like tongue in cheek about some of these things, right? Maybe about like some stereotypes about feminists, but like also just women. But I mean, there really are women like this who lie to themselves every January about using their fitness equipment or like sticking with their gym membership. And they manage to weave in that kind of like holier than thou attitude of like the women who play games and they're like mad when people don't think they're like a real gamer. Cause she's like, oh, I made a pacifist run on Undertale my first time through, including escaping the bullet hell. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm like pretty cool, you know? So goddamn annoying. Like, this is not a story. She literally is like, hello there. I'm gonna just give you a bunch of exposition. Can you imagine if you're at a party and someone said hello to you and then just dumped all of this on you? You'd be like, excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom immediately. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, this next page is like a little bit small, so I'm gonna read it from my phone, but you can kind of see the general layout of the page. So our protagonist says, this is my own private nightmare. So this guy here at the top with his microphone says, I'm so excited for us to be hosting the first woman in the workplace event. Yes, because in 2049, I'm sure this corporation has never hosted a woman in the workplace event before. It's so great to give all of you hardworking gals the respect you deserve. Thanks for putting up with all our tomfoolery. No lawsuits allowed. Choking. Can I get a hashtag me too? What time is it? up, referencing the whole time's up thing. Yes, these timely for 2049 references appear. And this man is depicted as speaking like a stereotype of how feminists think that men actually speak to them in current year. Then we have this lady in the black dress in the center here who says, if we look to emerging markets, I can see an incredible opportunity for growth here. My research asserts that China really could be our golden ticket. And the man next to her does the double sin of man interrupting and he peeing, so interrupting her while being male, and then repeating what she just said and acting like she didn't just say it while being male. He says, I just read this really interesting article. Barry, have you ever considered China? And Barry says, oh, I know you were going to speak up, but you don't need to be here, darling. We're just going to talk shop. I presume in the next panel that we don't see, she throws her drink in his face because how dare he? Because this is definitely how men talk. And especially in 2049, pretty sure they'll still call women darling casually while looking at their phone. So then we have these two men in the very background. They're looking at a painting and they say, God, they really don't make them like that anymore. Great to be at an event celebrating women and really celebrate their greatest attributes. Ha ha ha. Get it? Because they're looking at a painting of a naked woman and, you know, TNA, that's all we care about. Ha ha. 
ha ha ha. Then there's this woman in the kind of like pale dress on the right side with these two guys. And the guy on the right says, look, I don't want to ruin the night. And then, well, what I presume is this woman because we don't want to assume her gender. But given that she hasn't stated her pronouns, I'm just going to have to assume. Then quit spouting this binary gender essentialist transphobic build rot, Jack. And then he says, calm down. Don't be all emotional like that. Just give me a smile. Man, has there ever been such a collection of vile men in one room together? Why don't we just set it on fire and get rid of them all? So then she gets this ping on her smartwatch telling her that the peak, stage one, starts in five minutes. What that is, we don't yet know. Here at the bottom, our protagonist is looking at some paintings and the girl with the pearl earring says, you'll never live up to my perfect, passive, dainty, pale, wayfish, winsome, infantilized beauty, teehee. The middle painting says, don't listen to her. Orientalism aside, just between us, my artist added extra vertebrae to get this shot. Totally a reference to the whole, this pose couldn't be real, where are her organs? From all the comic book covers. And the painting on the right says, yeah, this pose is literally impossible. So another reference to that phenomenon. So then we have a woman on the left and she says, ah ha ha, that's such a funny joke because you know women have to tell men that everything they say is funny or men are gonna like stab them in the middle of a cocktail party then we have this man grabbing this chick's ass and he says heh heh don't mind a pat sweetheart it's a compliment dude in 2049 the way things are going if a man grabs a woman's ass at the party she probably has fucking like spikes that activate and just like destroy him you know what i'm saying feminists have no fucking imagination like it's one thing if they wanted to do a satire and like set it in current year when these things are actually happening and not 28 years from now when you know if feminists had their way things will have improved according to their standards but no in 28 years everything is still going to be the same and even worse because the awful trajectory that we're on or something okay so i guess she wasn't paying enough attention to her reminders or whatever all of a sudden a blood spot appears on the back of her skirt and one of the party goers is like Maya? Okay, I'm gonna stop right here and just say I do not understand this at all. This does not make any sense. If she had started bleeding really heavily, wasn't wearing any kind of menstrual capture device, shall we say, and was sitting on her skirt while that happened and then stood up, then I could believe this scenario. But given the way that blood flows physically, logistically with gravity, it makes no sense. This looks like blood came out of her asshole somehow, but like without gravity, like it just shot directly at the back of her skirt. It makes no sense. If they're gonna show this, like I get what they're going for. It's stupid in my opinion. This whole concept is stupid, but then blood should have been dripping down her legs and like onto the ground. It just makes me think that the people making this have never had this happen to them, but like Amelia Clark, last time I checked, was biologically female and the other names on this comic were also traditionally female ones, so... I don't know. I found this incredibly confusing, like incredibly confusing, but this is how they've chosen to depict it. So this is what we're stuck with. So let's move on. So we have the commentary from the party guests, disgusting, nasty woman, which is obviously a reference to the whole nasty woman thing from 2017 Women's March. Filthy. What do you mean natural? I'm sorry. Okay. But if someone started bleeding out of anywhere like somebody cut themselves and all of a sudden they're like bleeding all over their clothes and onto the floor or whatever it was i'm pretty sure people would have the same reaction it's not just because she's having menstrual blood problems but like yeah i am not on the whole train with all the like feminists that are like embrace it embrace your menstrual blood i'm like no I'm sorry, but no. I think Jermaine Greer talked about like needing to taste your own menstrual blood. Like, don't quote me on that, but I'm sorry. That's never going to happen. Like someone's going to have to put a gun to my head or the heads of people that I care about for that to happen. I embrace the rhythms of my hormonal cycle that goes along with that. Like I've tuned into my body since going off of the pill and felt the changes in like my cognitive abilities, my physical abilities as the month goes along, but I don't need to like get comfortable with like leaking my blood everywhere. 
together. And I'd be perfectly okay if I bled through my clothes at a fancy cocktail party with people being disgusted by it. And like, especially if she has this power and like, you know, she's getting her reminders telling her like it's about to happen and she just like ignores it. I don't know if it's supposed to be like a regular period because obviously that's what it's commenting on. It's like, we shame women for their periods. And I'm like, okay, maybe if you're talking about like certain third world countries or whatever, but like in America, we have so many different products and things to deal with. I mean, maybe this comic is saying that we should just like be free bleeding. Like, I don't know after reading this whole issue. I mean, there's three issues. I don't know what they're suggesting like in terms of managing this. Like we should just be bleeding through our clothes and that's fine. I mean, you're destroying your clothes. So that skirt looked like it was pretty fancy and probably expensive. So you probably don't want to do that just from a monetary perspective. But what the hell do I know? I'm just a woman who goes through this and has a totally different opinion than the people who put out this comic, or at least I think. I'm not really sure what their opinion is. Slight digression. But what I was trying to say is that I don't know if this is supposed to be like a regular period or if she has this like super heavy, super powered period. In the issue, they show that this thing started like a while ago. And so I feel like you would have tried to figure out like some more intense capture device for all the blood. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy, but whatever. Let's move on. So then we have more commentary from the party goers, unprofessional and unhygienic. Christ, probably can't even remember to pick her kid up from school. God, I'd probably just kill myself. Ruin that dress. Yeah, she definitely ruined that dress. No girlfriend of mine would ever do that. She didn't do it on purpose, Jack. Maybe she did. Maybe she did it to make a statement about period power and the natural cycles and like just deal with it, embrace it, ruin your super expensive dress. There's just stuff women are supposed to do, Marlene. Be on top of shit. Have kids. Raise a family. Like, I'm sorry. In 2049, is this person proposing that we've like, like, gone in the opposite direction and things are like super trad now because like as it stands no one is telling you that you have to raise kids or raise a family and plenty of women are opting out some because they can't find someone to make a family with and some who do have partners and just choose not to have kids but like the pressure to have kids from society I think is at its lowest point in all of human history so obviously we can see that her super strength is coming out because her heels are like making cracks in the floor because she's really upset that this person just said husbands included because as you know she's a single mom because she told you on the first page that was really sexist Marlene and now she's breaking her glass you're supposed to take care of other people yeah women they're supposed to take care of people when they don't they're bad and we throw them in jail right like what the f fuck am I even reading? There's no story so far. It's like this chick just turned to us, broke the fourth wall, info dumped on us, and now she somehow defying gravity bled through her skirt while standing up. People at the party are naturally disgusted by it. And for some reason, these people make the most like cartoonish sexist statements that like no one would ever make. Like I get that it's satire. So they're supposed to be like showing the problems, but like I've read satirical works and you don't have to write them like this. You can make them a story and readable. Catch 22. That's a great satirical novel. Go read that. It does not read like this. I'd also like to note that her boobs are starting to surge out of her top. I thought that comics written by women weren't gonna have this objectification of the female body, but oh my god, look at her boobs right there. And in this last panel you can see here her eyes are starting to glow like the superhero that she is. So that person from the other panel said, you're supposed to take care of other people. And they followed up with, that's the right way to be a woman. And our protagonist says, well, fuck as her superpowers unleash, her eyes aglow, her hair floating, her arms stretching like Mr. Fantastic, and her left spaghetti strap snapping and her boob dangerously close to flying out. Here's a better shot of the arm. And she says, here's the story of a beast who's a beauty or a beauty who's a beast. Here's how a fairy tale became, well, 
a shit show. Connecticut, age 8, 2028. A short seven years from now. I'm not gonna dramatically read every page because not everything is as interesting as those first couple of pages, but I will lay out for you the basics of what happens on the pages that I am not dramatically reading. So her mother is sick with something that is never made explicit, but her father apparently administers medicine at home and her dad is a scientist. And they have like TV in the background trying to give you some details about the way society is in 2014 like our water problem. As the cost of water continues to skyrocket, the optimates insist that rationing is counter to the free market. Ooh, those evil free market proponents, they're gonna destroy the world. So three years later, age 11, 2031, she's just recounting her childhood. Apparently she's adopted and sometimes her mom was good. Sometimes her mom was doing not so good. But as she says, we never gave up on us. And her dad says, we were put in this world to help each other, Maya. So there you go. That's the moral of the story in case you thought you weren't going to get any good content besides free bleeding onto your skirt. There you go. We were put in this world to help each other. So if you don't help each other, you're bad. Got it? Okay, cool. So then both of her parents die. Her mom dies and she says, and my dad just loved her too much. Died of a broken heart, they said, after I found him on the stairs, but I'm more inclined to think it was a broken neck. But oh, shh. She says in the top panel, look, I promise this gets funnier. And I'm like, don't make promises you can't keep, little girl. But right now, we have some obligational expositional backstorying to get through. Thank you for lampshading that for us. You did 22 Marvel movies. You can give me five pages. If you think that the people reading this comic watched all the Marvel movies, I think you would be mistaken. So what do you do when you're a girl who has lost everyone she loves in the course of a year, alone in a house full of food? you have zero desire to eat you do what you're supposed to do good girl that you are you lower your head you lower your eyes yes because that is what we teach girls we raise our girls to be quiet and hold themselves back so whatever, she throws herself into cleaning so she can not think about the fact that her parents are dead and she's alone. She muses about what do we leave behind when we die? Atoms, memories, love. I wasn't really sure what these bottom panels are like supposed to be. Is she fantasizing about poisoning herself or whatever? I don't really know. Anyway, so we skip ahead. It's 2049. She's 29. She lives in New Jersey and she's got a kid named Billy. And she's got that thing on her phone or tablet there that tells her how long until she's gonna bleed through her clothes again, I guess. So she's got some like nice guy, beta orbiter friend type who comes over and says, how's my favorite neighbor and his uh, beautiful but in a completely platonic way mother, fucking beta. She says, good morning, Benny. So we know his name is Benny. And we get more details from from the TV or maybe a radio. I don't know. It's like behind the toaster. Witnesses say the hole in the ozone resembles a face of Michael Jackson and are attempting to sell it on eBay. But Elon Musk claimed ownership of the ozone in 2022 and when asked for a quote by reporters said only na 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 na. And of course she's raising a socially conscious child who says that he finished The Lion King last night and uh, I have some concerns about Simba's treatment of the proletariat. Our protagonist Maya speaks to Ben and says, thank you so much for chaperoning Billy. His kindergarten is closed this week to deal with the heroin addicted raccoon infestation. Okay. Nah, no worries. What's the point of being an Uber driver with two O's, not a U, if you can't make your own hours? More room for thrilling adventures, swashbuckling romance, and other joie de vivre. And Billy asks if they're going to watch the PBS special on reconstruction, because that's what every little boy wants to watch. And as she leaves, she says to Benny, when I get home, we'll set up your your Tinder profile, but Tinder with a Y. He says, I know, I know. What's that Shakespeare line? Sell when you can, you're not for all markets. And then I guess he's like remembering some shitty date he had with some like Instagram influencer or something. And she says, hey, advocates, thank you for joining me on my live stream of my first date with Bernie. And he corrects her. Benny. This is actually like kind of funny, but like in a sad way. Like I could see this actually happening. She says, you're a prince, Benny. You're the best friend a girl could ask for. And you'll be the best boyfriend too. Just not to me. I have been trying out Mongolian throat singing. He says, whatever you're doing, it's working. See you tonight, darlings. And then Billy says to Benny, you really need to get your life together. And you know, actually ask my mom on a date. Okay. <laughs> 
This kind of, you know, negates the whole like, yeah, I'm like a tough single mom. I do it all. Yeah, because you have this dude to help you out who's like hanging around, hoping to get with you eventually. And you're all just like, la la la, I'll set you up with a profile. Like, why don't you want to be with him? I mean, maybe he doesn't know that she's like a superhero and, you know, she's got like a secret identity. Like, I don't know. None of that's been established in any way from like anything that's happened so far. Also, Benny, I'm not sure she would have time for you. You. She's got her corporate job. She's a superhero. She's a part-time sex worker. I mean, she's got to like keep up with Martha Stewart living and watch all those Ruth Bader Ginsburg speeches. So I just don't know where she's going to fit you into her busy schedule. You know what I'm saying? This is our life now. Billy's and mine. It's a little life, but it's ours and it's good. We've come so far. We've escaped so much. They thought this was an NYC, right? They've been pretty aggressive about keeping graffiti off of slash out of New York City subway cars for like a long time, so I don't know what's happened to, you know, bring people back to tagging subway cars, but this is part of their world. This is part of the dystopian world we're living in in 2049, according to this comic. So we flash back briefly to her at age 16 in 2036 in a trailer park, because apparently she was sent to live with a relative of her dad she had never heard of. So this is where we get the story of like how her power is developed. She says, it came on like a second puberty. Real weird shit started to go down. Growths, smells, unsightly skin. Get it? Because she started to disappear so you couldn't see her? When I was happy, I started to melt like a goopy pile of human fondue. The sound of my laugh became unladylike. I mean, you shattered the TV. I think that's a little bit more than unladylike. That's just like straight up destructive. And my survival instinct seemed to have heightened. So then here's their like big statement on like the way we treat teenage girls and like what they go through as women and stuff. Because she says, everything I felt came through in my body and all around me I heard, she's fucking crazy. She's just too emotional. You can't trust her. She's just a crazy bitch. She just isn't rational. She's hormonal. She's emotional. Oh, they had two. She's just too emotional and she's emotional. And another, she's crazy. It was she's fucking crazy and then all also, she's crazy. Yeah, I feel like they could have come up with a like, couple other variations there. And she says, yeah, I am. And I have no idea what just happened. So then she meets some guy. He says sister fuckers instead of motherfuckers. So that's interesting. He tells her not to be scared. It's cool what she did. He says, I don't think you're that much of a freak and tells her his name is Harvey. And then after that, we're immediately back in the present day of the comic in 2049. So I think we're supposed to assume that that was the father of her child. Child, Billy. And, you know, obviously she slept with the first person who told her she wasn't that much of a freak. I don't know if something went wrong with her protection or if like her superpowers just make her like super fertile and stuff. I don't know. So the comic authors are positing that the economy will be pretty much exactly what leftists think of the economy now. Maya says, the economy is just about as discombobulated as a baby in a topless bar. Most of us have two or three jobs to make rent and stay in a good school district. And and since I spend all day on my feet, they pull their weight after hours too. And then I think this thing in the middle is like her part-time sex work. Like what I said earlier that maybe she's like on OnlyFans basically because she gets an alert that a user has attempted to snap a screenshot without paying and it's like pictures of feet. So I don't know if she like, that's her thing. She sends like feet photos or maybe she has multiple things that she does on OnlyFans. But uh, anyway, she blocked that mofo. So she works for some company called Riley and Sons where they make a meat product with as little meat as possible. Corporate bills it as a green initiative, but the only thing green about it is what color it turns your bile. Unrecycled cardboard, old TVs, chemical runoff, John Doe's, it all ends up in our yummy time nuggets, TM. Sigh, I shouldn't complain. After Billy was born, I was an unemployed 19-year-old single mother on the run. Donald, my dad's old friend, offered to put me through school if I'd come and work for him. I love how this is like in speech bubbles, so it's not like in her thought bubble, it's like she's thinking it and we're like along for the ride. She's literally like in her workplace and she's just like saying all this out loud like she's in a telenovela or something. Also note that in the top left corner over there, people are still wearing masks and getting their temperature checked. So in 28 years, we're still going to be doing this crap. 
according to them. Or maybe they just think there's gonna be like a new pandemic every year of like a new thing. So we're just gonna do this all the time. I don't know, but just there's no hope. So of course her best friend is this woman of color who's in a wheelchair because God forbid in 28 years we've made any advances in helping people who have lost functioning of their legs to walk again. We'll just give them more technologically advanced wheelchairs. Like look at this futuristic looking thing. She looks like fucking Professor X or something. See now we have the rectangle that indicates that she's just like having this internal monologue. She stopped talking out loud so she thinks Wanda Boone is the most brilliant chemist in our department which doesn't stop Donald from second guessing her every step. Of course because she's a woman and he's a man and also she's a woman of color and disabled and as we're gonna find out she's LGBT etc etc. So of course this woman of color wheelchair lady comments that she hasn't uh, looked at this thing because she is too busy avoiding the frat rats around the cubicles. And then we get some examples of the things that these men say to her. Like this guy who says, look, I know you're married to a chick, but maybe you just haven't found the right man yet. I'm sorry, but in current year, if a man said that to you at your workplace, you could get him fired. But no, in 2049, she just sits there and puts up with it for some reason. This other guy says, you could have just laughed like the other girls. You didn't need to be such a bitch about it. I feel like most normal dudes, if they heard a guy saying that to someone, they'd be like, are you from a comic? Who are you? What is happening? Again, I get that this is supposed to be a satire, but like this is their distillation of like the way men talk to women as a general rule and like the things that they get away with or whatever. Not if you fucking push back against it. Not if you fucking tell them where to shove it. Jesus Christ. Christ. But again, I'm supposed to believe this is 2049? I cannot. And she also references their boss, Donald. Or Donald. Oh ho ho, so glad my girls get along with the boys. So glad you have a sense of humor. Not everyone is a fit in this workplace. That's why a woman will never be President Jacobson. That's like a really long nickname or middle name or whatever she's trying to pass that off as. And our protagonist, Maya, says, look, I know there are so many good guys, even here. Well, at least you can give us this one little concession toward normalcy and reasonableness. But the longer I stay in this place, the more I'm convinced I'm the crazy one. Yeah, because this is what men do. They just make us feel like we're crazy. And her friend says, it's a boys club in a man's world, Maya. What are we supposed to fucking do? Not start your own companies with a female-centered culture that you think is better. No, no. Better to just keep working at these companies that, you know, you don't fit in at. And also, I don't believe believe that this is 2049 because even now if the men at your workplace were talking to you like that even if your bosses didn't listen you just go on social media blast them and get them fucking canceled fired whatever and she says what's the option in this economy as if every single workplace is like this she just has no options sometimes i feel like everything i am is part of the problem unlearn relearn uplift donate, act up, speak up, don't speak over. Sometimes making a joke of it all is the only way I can survive, but I feel like for everything I try, I wind up making it worse or make it about me, which is the same thing. And her friend says, here's your ally cookie and gold star. Now get back to work. And she says, what would I do without you, Wanda Boone? Starve for starters. First, you can finish testing that latest batch of yum yum niblets. Then you can find a cure for white feminism. Yes, boss. Because because in 2049, nothing has changed. White women still have to be subservient to women of color and feminism because the intersectional types won the battle. So then she is doing some more thinking. The only thing my parents really left me, other than a highly unsecured laboratory full of dangerous chemicals and medication, was a real head for this stuff. So I guess that panel where it looked like she was like popping pills is supposed to like be telling us she was poking around in her parents' laboratory and she like ate pills or got exposed to chemicals or whatever that turned her into the period monster or whatever. They literally explain everything else in this over-the-top fourth wall obligational expository detail and yet you can't like do that for like what happened with her powers. We have to be all like subtle and artsy about it. Really? Give me a fucking break. Oh yeah, she says one day if I crack the code to whatever I took I might find a cure. Christ, wouldn't you? How weak and vulnerable and crazy would you feel if every time you worked out, blushed, laughed, got mad, jogged, lost your temper after 
after a deadline without so much as a thanks for your hard work from the jolly fucking dinosaur boss, this happens? I normally stay home on days like this so no one notices, but today she had some meeting with the boss so she had to come in. I guess it's supposed to be a commentary on like women's hormonal reactions and emotions and stuff. People think they're like overreacting and ruining everyone's day. Or is it just supposed to be about PMS? Like not every woman experiences like crazy, destructive, really intense PMS. You know what I mean? Like it's a thing, but it's like not a thing for every woman or sometimes it can be a thing on like one cycle and not another. So I'm like losing the thread here. Okay, so she's got her review with her boss and her boss is chastising her for being antisocial and says, where were you for the Super Bowl party at Honkers Are We? Where were you for Chris's bachelor party? The other girls didn't have a problem with the ears and tails for his special day. I'm sorry, are you describing like the office in Mad Men? Where is this office in 2021 that they're supposedly satirizing that even approaches something like less than this, but that you could exaggerate into satire? What the actual fuck? And then he tells her it's company policy to wear heels to the office. And he says, Maya, these dark glasses, you look like an alcoholic Bronte spinster. Please be a good girl and look me in the eye when I'm s speaking to... And then she runs out because I guess she's got like her crazy period coming on again or something. And he says, and dress code is no blazers in the office. It improves morale in the lab if we can tell your cup size. Like, I don't even... I've lost my ability to care at this point. So she uses her superpowers to like break the doorknob with her bare hands. And so then he's locked in the office and he's yelling at people to get him out. And he yells, glass ceilings are acceptable. Locked doors are not. And she says, smashing. This is real. This was written by someone and it was illustrated and it was published. This is real. I mean, this is supposed to be satire, but I am not satirizing them. They think that this is like good and funny and making their point and people are going to have their eyes opened to what women have to deal with in 2021 and by extension 2049. They're just really missing out on all those opportunities because they won't put on like a Playboy bunny outfit for one of their co-workers bachelor parties and you know, because their boss says things to them like it'll really raise more morale in the office if we can tell your cup size and she has absolutely no recourse available to her, obviously. Men in 2021 in most of corporate won't have a closed door meeting with a woman, let alone say the kinds of things that that man is saying to her. So then she like runs through the office, leaving destruction in her wake, ties this guy's shoelaces together because she hears him saying, girls are too worried about being rude to leave. They get tripped up. Get it? She's gonna make him trip. Oh my god, the jokes in this thing are just like, amazing. Okay, so in this panel, she's come home. Benny, her faithful sidekick, has dropped her son off at his play date. And you know, she's not trying to look hot around him because they're platonic. So she's got her sweat pants and hair in a bun. And I guess she's got a police scanner because then she hears about danger near where her son is currently at. So she, you know, gets Benny to drive her over there post haste. She's got serious mom adrenaline and rage going. So she tells Billy to like chill out and then she's talking to herself and making another feminist point about, you know, females accepting themselves. Stop it, Maya. Stop fighting with yourself. Stop fighting with your body. Just be, no matter how scary it is. Let it come. Let it out. Anger becomes strength. Fear becomes invisibility. And raw gut fucking terror becomes supersonic hearing. So she encounters this guy in here. He's got a knife, but she goes all like visible or something and misses her. But then she can still like connect with him physically because she like kicks him. So I'm not sure what that's about. Then she farts and he says, is that Mexican? Yeah, that was great. That was a great bit. Then she beats us over the head with some more feminist monologuing. Every woman has that voice in her head. The voice that says you're too old, too young, too fat, too skinny, too ugly ugly, too pretty, too messy, too neat, too needy, too cold. The voice that says you're both too much and never ever enough. You know what voice? I heard you. Now fuck off. And then she taunts him and says, aw, does someone need a little time out? I'm your mom now and I'm mad. But it's too late. She's had her stomach stabbed and it's bleeding, I assume, because she was like pregnant or something. And she says, him traffic. 
King and blurred and then she like sputters out because she dies I guess and some more feminist monologuing although this is in the boxes so she's not saying it out loud like a telenovela star when Billy was born I had no one there's always someone there when you're born but there's no promise you'll have anyone at your side when you go aka die I call the cops again I scream when she stops breathing all right so she wasn't dead quite yet my hands over the wound pressure 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 but there's no heartbeat anymore I stay with her as long as I can I try I try to give her some kind of humanity, not reduce her to the image you see a thousand times in TV or in movies. The poor abused murdered girl who doesn't mean fuck all except for a case for the grizzled ex-cop to avenge. Her name was Tiffany Nowak. Later I learned she was a nurse from Poland. She adored corgis. I mean, if they were good enough for the queen. She had very strong opinions on French versus Russian novels. She loved the snow. She hated chocolate. Her dream was to live in a beautiful cottage on the coast of Scotland, though I have no idea why it's absolutely freezing. Cool story, bro. Ah, the minutia that makes up a life. What will people say about us when we're gone? What's left of us? Atoms? Memories? Love? One final Snapple cap fact about Tiffany. In five minutes, the man who murdered her is going to die. So then she like chases this guy down and all these like memories and mean things that people say against women and her are like flashing through her head. And this guy's like, you can have them, the girls. And then this thing happens to him. And she's like, what the fuck? I mean, what the fuck is what I think about most of this comic. And then apparently when he like dissolved, a camera that he had implanted was left over. So she says hello to whoever's monitoring the camera. Then we got this like evil looking blonde chick with the bob. All the evil women are blonde. She says to the camera, are you the one I've been talking to all this time? I don't know if she means like through that dude or like if there's something that happened before this comic started that she's been investigating that like I'm not aware of. But yeah, she says that and she says fucking christ i never want to have a night like this night ever again but i'm going to aren't i I have to. My body has always felt like a secret, like a curse, like all the reasons we're hated made manifest. Feminism! My life would have been so much easier if I were just normal, aka not female, because we make women feel like they're bad for just being themselves like all the time, and all women just hate themselves constantly and just suffer and everything sucks. But I'll learn to work with my powers, I'll learn to let them come, and then I'm going to find you. I'm going to find all all of you. You're not going to get away with this. Mom is coming. Mother of madness. Yeah, mom. So that's it. That's the end of issue number one. I find it very strange that she got the powers when she was 16 and she's now 29 and she's just now being like, I'll figure out how to work with my powers. Like, bitch, what the fuck were you doing for the past 13 years? This explains why you just bled through your skirt somehow. I mean, again, the physics on that just really don't work but whatever dude you couldn't have done this like a bit ago like you've had time like what's changed now now you like inadvertently discover this human trafficking ring you never came across anything before this is all just like happenstance and new or whatever i mean she's got the police scanner i assume she uses it to like suss out crime to fight or whatever so we have a letter from amelia in the back amelia clark daenerys so she says this is her baby an idea that came whirling out of my mind after one conversation two years ago that started with, wouldn't it be funny if... Now why, you might ask, did I decide to write this? Well, I'd be lying if I didn't state for the record that I am an out-and-out -out feminist. You don't say. That wasn't clear. But a very friendly one. There are many things I care about, but one of the biggest is young people and their mental health. I say young because, dear reader, I believe myself to be old-ish. Well, old enough to have been around for the invention of texting and a late teenager for the arrival of Facebook. Hell, let's call a spade a spade. I watched Friends when it came out, so I missed a lot of the trappings of social media as a very tender young thing, but what I didn't miss was how MTV, remember TV channels dedicated to music videos? Okay, boomer. And the magazines I read made me feel terrible about myself, and thus a feminist was born. Not to say that this is just for those born pre-1986. That's what makes comics so magnificent. They are for everyone, and so is mom. I, like, cannot imagine that the audience for this is, like, people born 
pre-1986. I feel like the audience for this is like people around my age. Like, I don't honestly know how the Gen Z chicks will react to this. If they'll be like, yes, or they'll be like, okay, boomer, or like, WTF is this? So maybe for those who are like on the sort of intersectional train, you'll get like the 20 year olds to like maybe like 35 year olds, maybe. I feel like around 1986, I don't feel like pre-1986. I mean, my mom's certainly not gonna read this and understand anything that's going on in it. I wanted to make something that was at its heart about the power of the female form, the magical brilliance of what we as women have the joy to call our identity. Remember the first time you learned about hormones? I don't because no one ever told me, but I do remember the feelings of shame and self-loathing that accompanied my hormonal evolution as I blossomed into the young woman writing this now. Though frankly, I didn't blossom. I exploded, hair, blood, extra water, and extra tears. But why a comic? Well, aside from being too scared to follow my brother into the comic book stores as a kid, why? You going to get stabbed by all these geeks reading comic books? So whatever. She says because she was on Game of Thrones and she went to Comic-Con, she discovered comics and she started reading them. And there I saw all my favorite movie characters. I'm a superhero fangirl. So she watched all the superhero movies and then later was like, oh, they're my favorite movie characters in these comics. Not that I was watching movies about these comic book characters. And suddenly it dawned on me, this is cool. Whilst perusing all the selections on show, I also began to see that the female to male ratios were slightly off. And it was here that the seeds of mom were born. Even if I go with this, even if like most of the main characters in comics are men, fine, write comics starring female characters. Not that there are plenty of female characters in comics already, even through DC and Marvel, but whatever, do that. But why do you have to make it like this niche feminist satire? Just make a good story with female characters. One of the examples I always bring up is Avatar The Last Airbender. It's not a comic, although they did make comic continuations of the show, but there are so many amazing female characters in that show, and it's not like a feminist thing where they're like beating you over the head with crap. Anything that seems even remotely feminist makes sense in the context of that story and the characters and what they go through. It's not that hard to just write a story with female characters that everyone will want to read. Like she says this comic is for everyone. I'm like, honey, nobody wants to read this comic. Okay, like five people. Okay, maybe more than that. But definitely this is not a comic for everyone. This isn't even a comic for like just women. This is a comic for like a small subset of women and female identified persons, I suppose. So here we are at mom, a woman, a mother who finds that all the things she most hated in herself were actually super powered. Set that in an extreme capitalist structure, throw in some very real problems that face women everywhere. Yes, I could totally relate to all the problems that the women faced in this comic. They were very real and not at all like completely unrealistic exaggerations of things that don't even happen right now, really. And you have the book that is in your hands right now. Now, don't feel that I've forgotten about men. I mean, I don't think that you did. There were a lot of men in this comic. They were portrayed in a very flattering light. My dad was a wondrous human. My brother is the best man I know. All my male friends are good, good humans, but the society we live in today doesn't help you boys out one bit. Toxic masculinity is real and it affects everyone. There are characters aplenty in this story that address this too. If we can educate our boys young, then we can stand a chance at beating this problem to a pulp. And your son can also become a beta orbiter who does all this crap for this woman and she doesn't do anything for him but like say she's gonna set him up a tinder profile and then not actually get around to it because she's too busy with all the shit that she's doing. So I write this letter to let you in dearest reader on how I got here. I believe in the power of humans, of our ability to care, and our ability to be badass mothers. I wanted to put a mother at the center because we all had one. Speak for yourself. I sprang fully formed from my father's forehead. And I think they deserve a superhero makeover. Like, there aren't superhero characters that have kids. Like, fucking Jessica Jones. Go read Jessica Jones, the new stuff. She gets pregnant at the end of the original run by Luke Cage. And then she's a mom in the revival. That's just one example. And like in sci-fi and geekery in general, I can think of other examples of mothers that are there, like Orphan Black, 
Torchwood. How about Sarah fucking Connor from the Terminator franchise? Hello! So young people of the world, I see you, I see your beauty, I see your bright big brain, I see your individuality, I see your soul, and it is a miracle. Thank you for picking up this book. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. Thank you for being awesome. And then there's a section that explains Maya's powers. So when angry, she becomes super strong and super fast. When anxious, she gains supersonic hearing. When frightened, she becomes invisible. When sad, she can heal almost instantly. That's kind of weird. When laughing, the sound can shatter objects. When happy, she can super stretch. And last but not least, when she is at the peak of her powers and all emotions are go, her eyes blaze gold. This is known as the pinnacle. And apparently she bleeds, I guess. And then there's some resources for you. So if you or someone you know needs support, you don't need to struggle alone. Here are some organizations that will help you deal with rape, sexual harassment, and and sexual assault and also trafficking and modern slavery, hate crimes, domestic abuse, and LGBTQI plus rights and awareness, anti-racism, and mental health and suicide. So you know, like, they're here to help. Anyway, I just wanted to show this as an example of feminist satire, which I have seen in essay form, in books for a while. There was a novel by Libba Bray called Beauty Queens that even when I was an ardent feminist, like I read the book, but was thinking to myself, what even is this book? It makes no sense. And the only people that are going to read it are people that are already feminists and already know all these things that we're trying to like educate them about. So it's it's not really, you know, doing anything to help the cause. So I'm pretty sure I would have felt very similar about this comic, even when I still was a feminist. I'm sure feminists can be funny. I mean, I was plenty funny when I was a feminist. I just wasn't funny while trying to hammer home a feminist message. But I mean, if like feminists or anything like this chick and when they laugh, it shatters glass, then I definitely don't want to make feminists laugh. So we got to be careful. I haven't done a more like entertaining video in a while and I'm working on some longer series, so I thought I would just do this to kind of keep my channel active. And I figured that especially as we near the end of the second year of WTF is the World, that everyone could use something to laugh at. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're an ardent feminist that has stumbled across this video and you hate me and you hate this video, please feel free to leave me an angry comment. I read all of my comments and I will not be offended. If you have any suggestions for videos, feel free to comment those as well. Shoot me an email or join my community over on Locals. You can private message me there. You can DM me on Twitter. Lots of ways to get in touch. So thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And I hope to have more content for you very soon.